I'm Ingo Simonis. I'm with the Open Geo Spatial Consortium. And uh, today we will talk a little bit about, well, what role generative AI can play when we think about uh, climate change, adoption to climate change, resilience to disasters, uh, and so on. So the Open Geospatial Consortium is uh, mostly known as a standardization body. That's uh, what we have certainly focused on over the last uh, 30 years. But for the last uh, couple of years, we have uh, converted into more a hub system, a knowledge hub, where the geospatial community comes together to explore the latest challenges, right? How can we build urban digital twins? How can we adapt to climate change? How can we become more resilient to natural disasters using geospatial technology and using geospatial data? The OGC is a, a consortium of uh, roughly 500 organizations, and the goal is always to integrate data as smoothly as possible so that we allow data conflation and can derive better decisions based on data coming from different sources. Um, as already said, it's a knowledge hub, it's a community that gets together, it's a not-for-profit organization, and the main mandate is really to support everyone who has a need to take decisions based on geospatial data. What we face very often is a situation like this one here, right? We do have a city planner on the one side, and the, the city planner has a rather abstract question. So what does climate change actually mean for me? What do I need to do? Um, is it getting warmer? Is it getting wetter? If so, how much? In what periods? Right? What are the elements uh, that I can do? What are the costs affiliated with these potential actions? And on the other side, we have a data provider. The data provider does not think in these rather fuzzy questions, but the data provider has data from various data sources, so it might be simulations, like all the climate projections. Um, it might be uh, Copernicus services, Landsat archives, whatever data it is, right? And, and these two often do not get together very well. And you can use uh, any type of, uh, of person on the left-hand side, right? Here we have a fishing expert. So how do the, the, the fish develop in my area, right? Given that the sea temperature is probably rising, what does it really mean? And on the other side, again, you have data providers with data from ocean buoys, from satellites, from um, in-situ measurements, or, again, the climate projections. In the past, we had this idea that on the one side, right, on the needs side, we have our abstract needs and we can say, okay, these are the types of indicators that I need, for example, water temperature for the next 10 years in yearly intervals. And on the offering side, we thought, okay, we have the raw data coming from the sensors that's down here at the bottom. And then we can, we can enhance these raw data sets, right, to what we call analysis-ready data or decision-ready data. So um, nobody wants to see the raw data that has been sampled at maybe very high intervals or frequencies. Um, we want to have something that is at the right level for me to take my decision. And the idea was that somehow we can bring these two elements together. Let's uh, look at an example from the climate change domain. Now, let's say we have a city, I choose here Berlin, but it might be Stuttgart, and you want to execute a heat island simulation model for Berlin and assume that 20% um, of what is currently a parking space uh, would have been converted into a green space, right? What is the consequence of it? And what we see is, on the one side, we have these large language models, right? So you can pose such a question, and given the large corpus the large language model has used to get trained, right, all these different websites, all about heat islands and all the textual information about it, leads to the situation that you get very good um, interaction messages from a large language model like we have here, right? You ask what a heat island is, and you get a very decent definition. That works perfectly well. If you now try to figure out to which extent 
the engine has understood the concept of Heat Island, it becomes interesting, right? So this is an image uh, generated by ChatGPT as well with the task to illustrate what a Heat Island is, right? And you see it gets a couple of things right. So obviously it has to do, well, with temperature for sure. The sun plays a role. We have the built environment, mostly well, in a grayish tone. We have the natural environment. But that's where it ends, right? It does not fully get the element of um, heat islands. It gets parts of it. So we are far away from just asking the question we, uh, we have here on this slide, right? What is the effect if we do convert parking space into green areas? But at least a couple of elements it gets right. Um, it can understand that urban heat islands have different acronyms and are described in different languages with different wording and so on. That all works. But now we want to integrate data. And now the challenge is, I mean, most data is just gibberish, right? It's all the same data, but it's all different formats, different way of um, serializing it, different ways of providing it. And that is a pain for the engine, right? The smartness goes away because suddenly uh, the engine needs to work with this rather unstructured data. So we can learn about the heat islands, but the data about the heat island, if it is not structured, then it is pretty much gibberish and can't be used by the AI. So what can we do? Well, we need something like a large language model for data. Right? And as long as you have very structured data, that works like a charm. It works perfectly fine. We will see it in a couple of examples in a few minutes. But as long as we have rather unstructured data, well, the model needs help. Right? Without our support, it will not produce any reasonable results. So we need to understand how they learn these large language models and what elements do we need to provide so that I can raise these types of questions and the machine is answering me, right? Another question would be, what should I do at the city of Stuttgart uh, if I do have, let's say, 2 billion euros available every year for climate adaptation measures? What should I do if I only have 100 million available? And ideally, the tool gives me a couple of suggestions on the best measurements to deal with climate change. That works if we do have the holy grail, right? If we do have the magic puzzle piece, which is a fully defined standard and a fully defined standardized data model where everything has been agreed upon. The only challenge is that humans do not agree on all details, right? You, and even if two people agree on a standard, agree on an exchange format that could be then used by the language model to learn from the data or to even express questions against the database and reuse the data coming out of the database in a very consistent and reliable manner. That only works if you have full agreement, but full agreement is different. Uh, it's, it's very difficult. And what we see is um, if we interact now with uh, ChatGPT um, with data, and if we interact with ChatGPT that has been just trained with texture data. So if I ask a very simple question, right? What's the average apartment size of an apartment in a specific street in Munich? If I raise this question, um, what we see here is the answer ChatGPT provides to us, right? It has no clue. It can give us some information. The average apartment size in Germany is somewhere around 91 square meters. And, uh, well, in this specific street in Munich, it doesn't know. It just knows that it's probably somewhere between 60 and 100. And the reason is, well, this has been trained with all this text information it used before, right? But now, let's assume we do have this this puzzle piece, right, this standard that formalizes the way the data is offered to the engine. And now the engine can learn from that data and can send the questions, the queries against the data. And suddenly, 
if we do provide another standard, like here in this case, City GML, right, a mechanism to um, standardize data about city objects, like, for example, houses and apartments, we suddenly get the right answer back, right? Suddenly, ChatGPT is enabled to say, well, um, the average apartment size is 79.45 square meters. That works. That is state of the art today, right? This is the amount of sophistication you get today. But it works here because CTGML defines to the necessary level of detail, right? The CTGML provides enough information so that the the robot can learn enough how to interact with that data. In most cases, it rather looks like this, right? You have those, those individual pillars or those individual compartments, and every community uses either different standards or different flavors of standards or comes up um, with their own solution. So if we go back to our initial query, right, we want to learn uh, what effect climate change um, will have in future. And we want to understand, okay, well, if we, if we know that the city gets warmer in principle, and in particular in the inner part of the city, the temperature rises quite a bit, um, what can we do to lower the temperature, right? What effect would it have if the asphalt has been, will be removed and replaced by green structures? Well, first, the, um, the language model would need to understand what all these things mean, right? What is a heat island? What is a parking space? And what is a green space? So if I ask you what a parking space is, we probably find some good level of agreement. But what exactly is a green space? Right? And we see this very often when we use general terms. So try to agree just within the people we have here in the audience, what a surface is, right? We humans do not agree on these things because we all have a different conceptual model. We have a different worldview. And we can force agreement, but whenever you force agreement, what happens? People try to wiggle out, right? People try to not reuse it or to only provide you the bare minimum that you need. They only do it because you force them to do it. But it needs to understand these aspects because, I mean, um, we have a good example, right? Is this a parking space? I mean, obviously, someone parked here. Um, it worked to an extent, right? But you probably wouldn't define it as a parking space. But how does the engine know that this is not a parking space? The engine sees on a picture that there is a car and the car is somewhere on concrete. Well, there's some water in between, but I mean, it's so natural for humans, right? We see it and we see this is total, total nonsense. It's not a parking space, right? But the, the conception is easy for us. It's so much more difficult for the engines. So here's, uh, here's the way humans work, right? In the IT business, what we love to do is always two things. We see something which is good enough for what we need. We copy it, then we adapt it, and then we use it. But we do not formalize how we adapted it. So if I do copy something from someone else, change it slightly, and then use it, how can anyone else know what my stuff means and um, what it's actually good for, right? How can I still use it? I can't. Or the other uh, mechanism that we really like in the, in the IT industry is to reinvent, right? There are so many wheels around us, uh, let's do a couple of more wheels. Because my data model is certainly better than all the data models uh, developed and invited before. If we could now change this to a different pattern, right? If we could get to a link pattern where we say, okay, I used it from here, so I identify the source where I got it from. I then generate a profile, which means I have a formalized process, how I created my version of what I copy it from. This allows first to reuse quite a number of aspects. I can reuse what someone else has developed. I can still change it, but others can understand it suddenly because the changes have been made machine-readable. And machine-readability is absolutely crucial and essential if we want to allow the language models to understand 
what this data can be used for. So here are a couple of elements, right? So we know we need to build, obviously, some sort of link system. We call them graphs. And we need to have this link system for both for data and for processes. And we will see in a minute why this is the case. We often have in, uh, in data models examples like this, right? Some gibberish equals some number. And that doesn't mean anything to anyone, right? Except for the author. There's the risk that you start interpreting it, but you interpret it the wrong way. Well, do you still have the right message? But if we do have something that is machine readable, right? Like this one here, machines can understand what this data is. And if the, this URL, I mean, even though it looks like for consumption by humans, it is not, right? You can read it as a human, but the idea is it is fully machine readable. The engine can follow the link, can get to this address, and can retrieve additional information, right? So how was the daily peak temperature measured? How was it constructed? What was the sensor used? How was the sensor calibrated? All this information that is absolutely crucial if we want to use lots of different data sets in an automated way, right? And all generative AI is eventually automated processing of these different data sources. So what we need, we have data, right? And in the easiest case, well, we need to understand what attributes are listed and available for my data. And we need to understand, well, what possible values do exist so that I know what I can do with that data. Actually, I need to know many, many more aspects, right? I need to know how was the data constructed? What was used to build that data? What quality does my data have? Is the data sufficient? And in most cases, you get some data quality for the entire data set, right? But this is an average. This is a statistical uh, way of expressing the quality of a data set. What, what does it mean if you have one specific object, one specific building, right? Is it more with a better part of your quality or with a worse part within your quality spectrum? Because your quality is certainly not homogeneously distributed across all your data. And then I have these other aspects, right? What tools can I use to work with this data? Um, what schema has used to produce the data? So what we need is individual models, right? We need models like a provenance model that helps me to understand how something was created and how it changed over time. Then I need a data quality model. If I have a data quality model that is generic, it can be applied to any type of data set that gives me the necessary flexibility because I can define my data, you can define your data, but by using the same data model, the engine can understand what quality your data has, right? It's not necessarily understanding all the details about your data, but it can understand if the data quality is good enough so it can do the next step of processing, um, which means the next step of analysis, can I use this or not? And you may discard it, right? You may say, mm, the data quality is too low, even though this might be an interesting data set in general, but with this data quality, I don't need to uh, look at it any further. I don't need to analyze it any further because I will not be able to use it anyway. Then tool descriptions, right? Um, all these aspects, schema models, so how to express how some specific data has been uh, encoded and serialized, which then helps us to build the queries against this data. And we can bring all these models together, right? Data quality models, provenance models, tool models, schema mapping models. There are many, many of these models, and we call them building blocks. And one of the main ideas in modern standardization is do not try to agree on everything for your standard. You will never be successful, right? You can be successful if you agree on a tiny little detail, but if you want to generate a standard, for example, for a digital twin in an urban environment, or for something that can answer questions like we have seen before, the variety of definitions, the variety of terms, the variety of concepts is so big that you cannot standardize anymore all the details of it. But you can standardize a tiny little core, 
And then you can standardize these building blocks. And by using the, J the same provenance model, the same model to describe your schema, we enable that the tools can take over more and more of the manual steps that we need to process right now. So, we built our knowledge graphs for the data and the processes because we want to understand the data and we want to know how it was built. Right? If you have um, a language model or any uh, artificial intelligence model, you need to know what training data was used. Can I really apply the model to the data I have? Maybe it was trained just with data 100 kilometers uh, south of here. Right? Is it still similar enough to the data I'm using right here, or will it produce, um, well, basically inconsistent results, results I cannot work with? And then use these building blocks, because the building blocks enable the engines to work with different data from different communities. So here's the, uh, the modern research journey, right? We have these real-world problems, and we want to solve them, like, for example, how to enhance, how to restructure our modern cities to cope with climate change. And to do so, we need to integrate many, many Earth observation resources, right? If you have your projections with your new precipitation events, you know that you will get 150 liters per square meter of rain over the next 24 hours. You need to know from all your sensors what is the level of your current water reservoirs, right? How much water can you buffer before everything starts to overflow? Then what is the level of the rivers right now? How much water ca can still be discharged? What is the, um, the saturation of the ground around the city? And there are so many, many, many parameters that play a role. Um, that's just the Earth observation side, that's just the sensor side, but then you have your road network, you have your buildings, you have an environment that constantly changes. So we have many sources that we need to integrate to get reasonable answers. So on the one side, you want to integrate data, and on the other side, um, the more you want to integrate, the more data you have, the more time it usually takes you to um, polish all this data, to, arrive, to uh, remove um, all these potential issues you find in the data, and that can take years, right? Um, and you don't have these years, because once you have cleaned your data in three years, I mean, imagine how many things have changed in three years in a single city, right? The next, back, and the next aspect is metadata. So, as long as you don't have any adequate description, you cannot integrate data smoothly. But in the past, we worked with metadata models with fixed schemas, right? Um, those of you familiar with the ISO uh, standards, ISO 19115, a fixed schema for metadata. I mean, what does it mean? People are either not using it at all or using it very creatively because there's always something missing they need and you always require something they don't have. So we need more flexibility, which means we need these building blocks. The machine readability, we already talked about that, right? The machine readability is absolutely key because the integration right now is largely a manual process. But you can manually integrate as long as you have very few data sources. But if your number of data sources goes up and continuously uh, increases, then there is an end to what you can do manually, right? You need to have processes that scale. You need to have processes where the machine can take over uh, these activities for you. So machine readability. How do you get there? Well, it's all about policies and standards at this end at the end, right? The interoperability comes from the right level of standardization. And with right level, I mean it comes from this core specification that you need, and then on the formalization of the mechanisms, how to extend it. Because if you have your model, someone else has their model, but the way it has been extended is very well formalized by the standard, then your machine can go from here to the other model, understand not everything, 
but sufficient details to say, okay, well, this data is probably very useful for your purpose, or this data cannot be used at all. And then, once we have done this, once we have the machine readability, then we can leverage the power of AI, right? Then we can use artificial intelligence first to navigate through all these different data sets which are out there. We can go from one thing to the other. We can understand the terms. We can understand the definitions. And we can eventually deal with this ever-increasing amount of data. The next aspect then is we need to provide complete frameworks, right? Because if you do have data and you do have processes that work on that data, be it analytics or be it visualizations, you need to know how they relate to each other, right? What analytics can I run on a specific data set? Can, is it even qualified for specific types of analytics? And that's where we then need to bring these elements together in the operational environments where data is available in a distributed way, processing capacities and visualization capacities are available in a distributed way, and we need to link them uh, to each other. Once we have linked these elements, right, once we have the AI and we have these links, which we call here graphs, then we get into the space of explanatory AI. Because do you really want to rebuild half of your city based on the results from some tools that someone has programmed with some data you're not quite sure about? Right? How do you sell this information to the people that should vote for you at the next elections, right? You want to have some more explan explanations why you suggest to do a specific operations, and that's where we need to bring these elements together, the graphs and the artificial intelligence. And that then leads to the modern research, right? That leads to the situation where we can leverage the power of AI, but it requires machine readability, it requires the building blocks, because we need flexibility, and then we can really use the power of these large language models for both for data and for processes. And then we eventually can answer questions like this one here, right? We can ask a natural language question, and the machines will be able to respond to us. So what are the key ingredients, right, of successful generative AI? Well, first, understand what others mean with their data and what they meant when they created the data, right? That brings us to all these definitions. We need to have all the terms, all the workflows, all the provenance aspects. Every element needs to be described in a machine-readable way. Once we have done that, we can generate these, uh, these uh, building blocks, and, or we can use these building blocks, and by using the building blocks, we can be sure that the mechanisms are the same that have been applied, and then we can integrate. And this then allows us, together with formalized structures, standards for data exchange, for example, to get to processable data, where we can really have data that we can process by these tools that then seem to almost magically generate responses to our questions. But because we have these provenance traits, we can exactly say, okay, this decision or this, this result coming or this response coming from the model has been based on the following data sets and on the following processes, and these processes have been built the following way. So we can really dive all the way down to the individual atomic elements of the recommendations coming out of the AI tools. So standards is really the key here, right? But standards need flexibility, and we should really discard these ideas about fixed schemas and fixed formats. We need a very, very high level of flexibility today. And that's an, uh, it's an open invitation, right, as a, as a member of the Open Geospatial Consortium. Help us finding the right level, right? How much needs to go into a standard, and how much needs to be fully flexible. The more flexibility you have, the harder it becomes for the tools to integrate everything automatically. 
but the more you put into a standard, the more you need to agree on it. And agreement is difficult on the human side, so we need to balance these two difficulties. There are amazing projects, right, like uh, Open Science, for example. You have now incredibly big data sets. If you look at the simulation or the the climate change predictions coming out of the international, uh, of the IPCC, um, the, basically the climate um, experts doing those global uh, projection models, and then you need to downscale this. This is an extreme amount of data, and you may have a, a process that runs on that data, but you do not have the necessary uh, credits to run it on a specific platform, but you have another platform available. So you may want to transport the algorithm from one platform to the platform you have your credits for and rerun the same process. So we need to be able to describe complete workflows in all detail so that we can use different computing platforms to run complex processes to answer queries like that. And sometimes it gets completely wrong, right? So this is what AI provided to me when I asked about the climate and disaster resilience pilot. And I wondered, okay, what exactly has a climate and disaster resilience pilot to do with a whale that somehow carries an airplane, right? So we, we see how much hallucination is still in these models as they are right now. But we know the ingredients now, we know what we need to define and we need to standardize to enable them to give us more reasonable answers, right? And this is, for example, what we do in other initiatives like the Climate and Disaster Resilience Pilot, where questions like we have seen before are answered, right? The, all systems are now working with large language models plus, oops, large language models that have been trained with standardized data sets. And that allows us to use the knowledge from the textual data that went into the training or was used for the training for the model and at the same time the real-time data coming out of the database and together they provide much better, much more sophisticated answers to the challenges we have. So this is an open invitation. Join us. There are many, many more initiatives that require the better understanding of what do we need to agree to, where do we need flexibility, and how to do these most efficient frameworks that then allow artificial intelligence to work on the data and to interact with us like humans. Because what we have seen, even here on Intergeo, right? I mean, how many client applications have you seen here? But how many questions do you have each client application answers exactly the questions the programmers had in mind, not the questions you have in mind, right? If you have a box with five options, well, you can click five options. But what if you have the sixth question? You need to build a new client. We cannot build this amount of clients that we have questions to answer, right? We need to enable the systems to interact with us in natural language. But we need to be careful to avoid hallucination, to avoid all these weird constructs we see sometimes coming out um, of the artificial intelligence models. And with these words, I thank you very much for being with me this afternoon. Great that you have been around. If you have any questions, I'm still around. Uh, please let me know. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>